So as you know, almost uh, many of the uh, predictions of uh, inflation paradigm have been observed and confirmed by observation so far. Uh, primordial gravitational waves are excluded, of course, which are waiting to be observed, hopefully. Um, inflation is uh, happening uh, when the universe was at its highest energy scale observable to us, uh, which is huge. And then, um, as you know, non-Abelian gauge field theories are the widely accepted framework for particle physics uh, to work uh, at around this scale, which is basically the God scale. So a very natural question to ask is, what would be the role of SU2, like uh, non-abelian gauge field during inflation because they can be around. Um, oops. Yeah, and if they were around, it could be, um, could they leave something like a fingerprint on CMB or in, in cosmology and then by observing them, we say, okay, so they were around. Uh, this talk is based on this, uh, this two papers in collaboration with uh, Kaloi and Lozanov and Ichiro Komatsu, uh, but uh, it's actually based on many other works which have been that much earlier based on uh, what I have done, um, Peter Axet, Mark we uh, Wyman, Marco Peloso, Ichiro Komatsu, Anikat Agrawal, and many other people. So, um, the outline is as follows. First, I will talk about SU2 gauge fields and inflation. Then I will talk about this extra spin two particle production and the chiral gravitational waves generated by this um, spin two particles. Then I will briefly talk about gravitational leptogenesis in this setup. And finally, I will finish by a summary. So the story of SU2 gauge fields in inflation started back in 2011 when I was trying to understand what other people are keep telling me about gauge fields, um, that gauge fields are not important in the physics of inflation because they break the isometry um, of the FW metric and because they have conformal symmetry so they cannot uh, stand the uh, exponential expansion during inflation. So while I was trying to prove they are right, I ended up finding something totally different. Um, so in the context of uh, for the Einstein gravity, uh, I considered SU2 gauge fields during inflation, and then uh, we uncovered a couple of very interesting features of uh, these fields during inflation. First of all, I realized that if instead of a U1 gauge field, you uh, start with the SU2 gauge field, then there is this um, FRW friendly ansatz which respect the symmetries of FRW. And if you uh, write the energy momentum tensor for this ansatz, and you notice that A times delta AI is basically the spatial triads of FRW. So you will end it up with an energy momentum tensor which is perfectly isotropic and homogeneous. The second thing was that if you add um, other interaction for the gauge field um, to the Yang wheels, then in principle you can break uh, conformal symmetry. And um, in these two papers, we came up with the first and the, the most simplest possibility. Um, the other interesting uh, thing that we realized in these papers was that if you perturb the gauge field around this uh, FRW friendly ansatz, then you will have a an extra uh, spin two field. So if you perturb the, the gauge field, you will have some scalar and vector degrees of freedom apart from the normal one. But in addition, you would have an extra spin two field. Um, and this spin two field breaks parity and also couple linearly to gravitational waves, um, which uh, generate chiral gravitational waves. Um, so how we broke conformal symmetry, this is the, uh, the action for uh, gauge flation here by adding uh, this term to the action, uh, we, we broke the conformal symmetry and it's basically um, 
by integrating out a massive axion in a limit that the mass of the axion is quite high, you can show that for this parameter you will end up with this action. Um, exactly one year after um, gauge inflation, um, Peter Atzid and Mark Wyman uh, <coughs> uh, studied the whole theory of this model, which is the chromonatural model, in which instead of uh, studying the system in a limit that the axion is really massive, they just forgot about that, uh, that constraint and <coughs> uh, studied the whole uh, system. But because the difference between these two models is basically one a scalar degree of freedom that we integrate out, uh, so our vector and tensor perturbations are exactly the same. Um, I keep making the same mistake. <laughs> so inspiring by these two models, several different models with SU2 gauge field have been proposed and uh, studied. And here is a very incomplete list of them. Um, so, because many of the features, uh, this, the, the interesting features in this model is based on having a non-zero VEF for the SU2 gauge field, and they have lots of things in common, so with Ichiro, we uh, decided to write them in this unified form and then um, extract whatever information which is possible for this model uh, as far as possible model independent. So all of these this models in the list can be um, right in this form, then uh, SA is basically this uh, gauge field action, which is, uh, uh, can either be the gauge function or the chromonatural. So this phi here is the axion, which is coupled to the SU2 gauge field. And then you can have uh, systems with, uh, in which the um, SU2 axion setup is not the inflaton setup, but you have this other scalar fit, which is the inflaton, or your uh, gauge, um, SU2 gauge field can be massive by um, having some uh, interaction uh, uh, with the Higgs. So um, in principle, um, if this alpha edge is zero, we are uh, studying a model which is massless, a massless SU2, or if it's one, is the Higgs version of the model. Um, and then this alpha S, is, if it's zero, then as I said, the axion uh, SU2 gauge field is the inf um, inflation setup, or if it's one, uh, it means that the um, axion SU2 sector is basically um, a spectator. Um, so, as I said, uh, all of them share this SU2 gauge field with a non-zero VEF, so all of them uh, enjoy this FRW friendly VEF solution, um, and also they uh, have this new spin-2 field. Um, this extra spin-2 field is massive and always decaying after horizon crossing. It's chiral with the short phase of uh, size of a particle for reduction before horizon crossing that I will tell you shortly. And sources gravitational waves at the linear order, so it generates chiral gravitational waves. So this is the field equation of this B particle, and from now on, uh, whatever I'm, uh, I'm showing is value for all of this family of models that I said. Um, so this B field, which is basically the spin two um, field of the gauge field uh, governs by this equation, which as you see has this derivative interaction proportional to delta C, which is a, a combination of the background field, like the axion and the BEV of the SU2 gauge field. And it also have a mass term, um, which also um, came from the self-interaction of uh, the B and the VEV of the gauge field. And then this um, effective uh, frequency can be, neg uh, first of all, as chiral because of this uh, derivative interaction. And also, um, in when uh, for the polarization with the minus sign of delta C, it violates a, a adiabaticity conditions for a short period of time before horizon crossing. So in principle, so uh, more precisely, um, here we have the deviation from adiabaticity 
in terms of the physical momentum uh, for two uh, values of delta C, which as you see, this shaded area is showing the, the regime in which we have particle production for each of these modes. Um, so uh, yeah, this uh, spin two particle uh, experience has um, two phases of particle production, but the first one is much more efficient. So um, the, the number of particles generated here comparing to the one generated uh, closest to the uh, point of horizon crossing um, are ten, 10 times higher. So most of the particles are generating here for the blue line and here for the red line. Um, so, as I said, these, um, so I have a kind of a um, chiral particle production in the setup, which, um, which means that uh, virtual B particles in, in the space, because of this derivative interaction with the background gauge, uh, background gauge field and the axion, um, uh, makes pair particle production. But because it's, it can only, only the B plus polarization um, got generated, uh, that's a chiral particle production. And then uh, here we have the uh, physical number density of the pairs of B particle productions, um, which is here, but for the massless SU2 gauge um, uh, uh, in the, in models in which the uh, SU2 gauge field is massless, it has a simple form, so the um, number of pairs is proportional to this delta C, uh, which somehow uh, is, uh, um, is responsible for generating these particles. And uh, also we have this uh, uh, delta C dependency in the um, exponent. Um, so, as you may guess, this number density is kind of large. So one very uh, important question to answer is to, to study the back reaction of this B particle to the uh, background and uh, check if uh, they won't destroy anything. So um, here in um, this recent paper with uh, Ichiro, we found the analytical formula for the back reaction of the B plus particle. Uh, to the field equations and also its energy density and use them to constrain the, uh, the, the, the whole family of models. Um, I just don't want to make things complicated. This zeta A is basically uh, a dimensionless size of the web of the gauge field and this, this um, psi Z0 is basically uh, a measure of the mass of the uh, uh, mass that the uh, Higgs particle generated for the gauge field, and then this uh, all of these shaded areas are the val uh, are the valid uh, parameter space for each of uh, each scale of inflation. Which, as you see, uh, the size of this back reaction uh, decreases with de uh, decreasing the size of the uh, Inflation, so uh, it's proportional to h over m Planck uh, squared. Okay, <clears throat> so up to now uh, we saw that the polarization B plus has a short uh, time of particle production before horizon crossing, while the B minus uh, was uh, most of the time very close to uh, its uh, vacuum state. Here we have in, in this plot. Uh, we have uh, B plus over A and B minus over A in terms of the physical momentum. And as you see, the red line, the B plus one, experiences this short phase of tachyonic groups before and around the horizon crossing, uh, while the B minus is basically always very small. And um, the mass term of the B particle, they have the same mass and it's uh, always more than eight. So both of these polarizations uh, decay after horizon crossing. While before the horizon crossing and because of this phase, they are uh, chiral and um, they source gravitational waves. Um, here we have the energy density of the B plus particles, uh, which is negative in most of the parameter space. And that's because of this uh, short phase of tachyonic growth. 
which uh, made the most of the contribution. And then uh, this uh, B particle source gravitational waves um, in this way. So they provide a source there. And the, the efficiency of this anisotropic stress is proportional to psi over M Planck. So somehow uh, this uh, anisotropic stress uh, is proportional to the uh, wave of the gauge field. And uh, this uh, capital uh, pi is basically a linear function of uh, B plus and B minus. Um, so now we have uh, our gravitational wave now um, has two parts. Uh, one uh, from the vacuum fluctuation, uh, the, the homogeneous part of the solution of this equation, which is the vacuum uh, gravitational waves and totally unpolarized while the other one is sourced by the B uh, particles and is highly uh, polarized because uh, um, H minus, which is coupled to B minus, receives almost nothing, while the H plus sourced by this B plus, which has this uh, short phase of enhancement. Um, so the result is, uh, uh, is a uh, gravitational wave which is partially uh, Cairo. Here I uh, have the gamma plus gamma minus, which is basically H over A in terms of the physical momentum. And, uh, and here we're basically, as you see, um, uh, the, the blue line here uh, is almost uh, zero, which is the source part of the gravitational wave, uh, the, the minus sign while the uh, red line, the, the red line is basically the um, gravitational wave sourced by the B plus. And then the ratio of the power spectra of the source and the vacuum uh, gravitational wave um, can be uh, written in terms of the uh, numbers of the B particles created um, times the efficiency of the interaction. So it's uh, times some uh, order one quantities. So basically, um, the more uh, uh, so the more of this B particles that we generate, we would have more um, sourced uh, gravitational waves. But uh, because the, uh, the the size of the interaction, bet as you see here, the size of the interaction between the B particles and H is proportional to the wave of the gauge field, so we have it um, exactly as we expected. So what is pi? Pi plus minus. Oh, uh, pi plus minus. Um, it's uh, so the whole um, quantity here. So as you know, the equation of gravitational wave, uh, the right-hand side is not always zero. It has a source, which is the tensor part of the energy momentum tensor. And um, so the whole, um, the whole term here is basically this pi i j t. Um, I wrote it in this way just to make more sense. <laughs> I hope, actually. Um, so because of uh, this effect, and the tensor power spectrum is not uh, entirely given by the scale of inflation, but we have this extra factor, which is the, um, the wave of the gauge field, and also the uh, numbers of uh, pairs product, uh, B particles product, producted during inflation. Um, which uh, can generate sizable tensor perturbations uh, without large fields. And also, um, as you saw, we uh, have uh, this parity violating interaction. So uh, the tensor power spectrum is partially um, chiral, and parity odd correlations are uh, non zero in our system. And it's not all, actually. Uh, we have more. Um, so the possible large tensor non-Gaussianity in the setups, which has been studied by um, Agrawal, Fujita, and Komatsu recently. 
Um, another one is uh, the fact that unlike the U1 case in which if you have a U1 gauge field and then you um, study the Schwinger effect and the back reaction, okay, thanks. Um, the Schwinger effect and the back reaction of, uh, uh, of the generation of scalar, um, um, scalar fields coupled to this uh, U1 gauge field, then you will realize that the size of back reaction can be huge. Uh, while here, <clears throat> for the SU2 gauge field and this FRW friendly ANSATS, we realize that because of the isotropy of the ANSATS, uh, this uh, effect is really negligible, which was like a miracle. We were very excited. <laughs> and um, finally, um, as I will explain shortly, the setup provides a natural uh, mechanism to uh, explain matter asymmetry in the universe. So here we have um, the inflato leptogenesis idea by Alexander Peskin and Sheikh Jabari back in 2006. Um, they realized that uh, if they have a system with chiral gravitational waves, uh, they can have a non-zero RR dual. And then, um, uh, in a standard model in which n l minus n uh, r is three, because we have three left-handed neutrinos, why we don't have any right-handed neutrinos in a standard model, uh, they realize that they can generate some uh, net lepton number uh, density during inflation. Um, so, in another word, um, uh, by uh, I mean, chiral gravitational waves um, can somehow generate a net lepton number by uh, gravitational uh, anomaly in standard model. And uh, one thing that I should mention is that in the original um, paper by uh, uh, this three gentlemen, um, the source of uh, parity violation and the chiral gravitational wave is uh, the fact that they added a term to the action, so they modified uh, um, the action by explicitly adding RR dual, um, which has some issues uh, because uh, then uh, the upper bounds on this uh, can make the, the result um, insufficient for explaining the DFZ values. Um, then back in 2014, I realized that um, the system, I mean, I uh, realized that, okay, I have uh, chiral gravity waves for free, let's uh, get some lepton number from it. <laughs> and uh, it turns out that the setups are a natural setting for uh, using uh, inflationary leptogenesis as well. And then the net lepton number density, which I found, um, is like this, so we expect to have H cube because that's the scale of inflation and uh, with the same um, um, dimension as NL. Also, it depends on the, um, uh, the energy density in the gauge field. And it's uh, proportional like this to the, and this lambda is mass of the right-handed neutrinos which we integrated out. To, to have the uh, um, chiral anomaly. So here we are. Um, we saw that the presence of um, SU2 gauge field in the matter content of inflation leads to new spin two fields with sizable particle production before horizon exists and relax the direct um, connection between the scale of inflation and the power spectrum in the t gravitational waves. And it violates of the, the lifespan because for generating uh, sizable gravitational waves, now I don't need a large, uh, um, large field value. Um, I didn't talk about this part. And we saw that the gravitational waves are chiral, so uh, the parity odd correlations and CMB are not zero anymore. Um, also, um, in the systems, uh, 
we can have large tensor non Gaussianities, and uh, we were fortunate enough that the um, Schrodinger effect in the scalar and fermion sectors are really small thanks to the isotropy of the uh, background gauge field and then uh, the setup as a natural setting for uh, leptogenesis. Thank you.